All right. Hello, hello. Let's see if we are set up right here. Yeah, I, I see everyone. I hear everyone. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hear the clickety check uh, keyboards, so we're all uh, set to go. All right, so welcome to Coded Live, folks. Um, uh, I'm your host, Sam. I'll be on uh, with some very good friends of mine today. And it's a special stream because we had a gigantic release. Uh, so we're going to go over all the things that makes developers a little bit more productive. So with me, I have uh, some good friends of mine. So why don't we go around maybe clockwise and introduce ourselves, uh, starting with Eve. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be part of the lineup today. My name is Eve Trizillo, and I work with Sam on the developer relations team. And I'm responsible for the Fiddler family of products. And we're going to be covering some things in Fiddler Everywhere today and Fiddler Jam. Nice, nice. Peter. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Peter here. I'm uh, part of the engineering team, sales engineering team in uh, Progress. And I happen to know a little bit about testing, UI automation testing, test studio, and everything related about it. And today we're going to talk about the latest and greatest in um, our testing release. Yeah. Look how look at the humbleness. He just knows it just a little bit. He just has like 20 just years of experience working on it. <laughs> All right, and Michelle, and you're on mute, I think. Yeah, hey, right. okay, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Mikhail Vladov, and uh, I'm the engineer manager of uh, Gizmog, and I will show you some of the stuff that uh, we have uh, delivered with uh, our recent release. Cool. And Nelly. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Nelly, and I'm one of the technical support engineers for the Telerik reporting team and also report server. Nice. And we are missing one other team member of ours who was supposed to join, but he was having camera issues and Rick. Um, so we'll give him some time to, you know, come back. Um, but here, here's the plan today. Um, we're going to go over all things uh, developer productivity um, uh, in our release. And um, like all of these wonderful people are going to cover the things that they are uh, the most passionate about. So, um, let me let me actually uh, start by uh, sharing. Oh, and actually, while we do that, uh, our good friend Rick finally has rebooted his machine. And join. Okay, can we hear each other? Okay, now we are back. Everyone kind of froze for a second, so maybe it was me. Yep. Yeah, Rick, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. All right. So we did our intros. Uh, how about you introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rick Helwich. I'm a principal sales engineer with uh, with Progress. I'm going to be talking a little bit about reporting, report server, all the new features and bits and bobs that have come out. So I'm excited to get started. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So yeah, we have about you know two hours. Uh, this is really informal. Just friends here. We are trying to unpack everything that's in the release. Uh, let me uh, start things off by maybe sharing uh, my screen a little bit. Uh, so let's see if technology will cooperate with us today. That, share that screen. There we go. Okay. So um, if you folks want to get started and kind of tinker with uh, some of the things that um, we are showing you, oh, and I see in the chat room, uh, our good friend Cindy is here. Hello. Hello, Cindy. And thank you uh, for getting us going. Uh, that's what we are doing, uh, is what Nightbot is telling us. We are unpacking uh, the release. Uh, so if you head out to blogs.tilay.com, that's where I'm at. And uh, all of our content lives there. But this one here is pretty much pinned here because this just happened um, earlier uh, this week. Uh, so the Tilaric and Kende UI release is here. But in there is also a lot about productivity. So we have had. One stream yesterday that was all things you know Kendi UI, and then on Monday we will have another stream for all things Telerik, and then we also have our formal webinars where I put on a formal shirt and I you know I do away with my hat, uh, but this is still uh, still informal here on Twitch. So if you want to uh, kind of look into uh, what uh, we are uh, doing, oh and by the way we are also streaming on YouTube, so again keep the questions coming if you have any questions as we are going through this, but this is kind of the you know, one source of truth where we documented everything that we did in this release. And we 
you know, stand on the shoulder of our amazing engineering teams and product managers and testing uh, teams who put together this release. So uh, let's go down here, reporting, testing, mocking, debugging, and productivity tools. That's what we are talking about here today. So Rick and Nelly are gonna talk about all things reporting and report server. Uh, Misho is gonna talk about all things just mock uh, and some really uh, cool things happening there. Test Studio, uh, again, uh, some really cool uh, enhancements and then Fiddler everywhere. Uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, Eve and me finishing uh, the day off here. So that's what we are uh, up to. And again, if uh, if you folks want to, um, you know, chime in uh, and, you know, kind of see what we have done in this release, that's, that's the place you go uh, look at. And um, every one of our product pages is linked as well. So you can see uh, what's going on in each product. So uh, I think we agreed upon, um, you know, starting with the reporting first. And Rick and Nelly, you, you folks still feeling like it? I'm good, as long as the uh, the demo gods cooperate with me today. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, um, I stopped sharing, and uh, so who wants to share the screen? Rick, I'm guessing you. Ah, uh, yes, I'll share my screen. Button, button, and that is button. our good friend said keep keep yeah, keep us going uh, in the back rooms. Yeah, so thank you so much. And I see your uh, desktop here, Rick. All right, you are up and running, and we see Visual Studio. But do you want to start off, Rick and Nelly, just giving us just a ten thousand feet view of what is Telerik reporting and report server? What's all that's new in this release? Sure, uh, I can I can go ahead and do that. Um, so Telerik reporting uh, is is a lot of things. It's 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 .NET centric. It's UI agnostic. It's basically your go to framework whenever you need to build any style of report. And pixel perfect rendering is a key feature that you need. If you need to make sure that your reports look exactly the same, whether they're printed or viewed on a screen or exported to PDF, um, definitely go to Telerik reporting. If you need to do anything like check printing, receipt drafting, invoicing, definitely go to Telerik reporting. Pretty much anything that you can imagine being in any size page, whether it be eight and a half by 11 or uh, post-it size, uh, go to Telerik reporting. And um, if everything you're seeing on the screen here looks like uh, sort of like Egyptian hieroglyphs to you, we have a product called Telerik report server, which you don't have to worry about doing any coding. Um, it is a complete ready to run reporting solution. All the bells and whistles baked in, just install it and go, just like your, your favorite Microsoft application. Yeah, so Rick, do you want to pull up uh, a browser and just uh, you know pull up the reporting uh, homepage, show us a little bit about what's new? Absolutely. Uh, po yeah, Polycat Games, hello. Hello, by the way, uh, I like your handle. And uh, one other thing uh, I forgot to mention at the very start is um, we have this thing at the down and here at the bottom. If you have any questions, like, sure, you can ask us um, uh, in chat here. But if you want to have more of a conversation, leave a little bit of a breadcrumb trail about what we're doing, uh, then ask away on Twitter. If that's where you are at, uh, use the hashtag HeyTaleric, and we'll we'll love to get back to you. Um, so, yeah, this is um, all things reporting, like uh, Rick said, really, uh, you know, um, complete uh, out-of-the-box reporting solution um, uh, works fundamentally with .NET, but you can render the reports and deliver them on just about every platform. And uh, to me, like report server, Rick, is just the thing that you said, like you don't want to do all of that hosting, all of that automation and, and, and delivery, all of that yourself. You just want to have somebody do it for you. Mm -hmm. And it's a turnkey solution. Absolutely. And in telework reporting, it was always built to be a library. So uh, it has all the reporting features in it, but just the reporting features. And there's a lot more that goes into a full scale operation than reporting. I mean, we could do an entire session, Sam, on authentication and authorization alone. Um, so if you don't want to become an expert in those, you know, in those topics, Report Server has all that baked in with, you know, many different ways to handle authentication or just go with the one that comes in part in the installer. So it's a great solution, you know, if you don't want to build something totally custom. But if you yeah. do, you know, more power to you. We have tools for that as well. Yeah, yeah. so this is the reporting homepage. Um, you see so this nice little yellow banner at the top, which takes you to everything. Yeah. It's what's <laughs> new, what's coming out. And let's pay attention to this nice little uh, orange box here, you know, the, the free trial. Everyone should be going and clicking on this if you don't have a license. 
So what I see is on the left, uh, on the menu, it says, what's new? Is that uh, talking about what's new in this release? Uh, let's see, I believe so. That's going to go down quite a bit. Yes, yeah, so this is a link to a couple of different um, uh, articles um, about new features that just came out. You can also go to the roadmap section here and go to what's new is another other way to get to it. And I think if we click on that box, it takes you to that same page. So we have a, a good number of new features that came out in this release, and we'll get a chance to play with these and you know live a little bit, I hope. Um, Probably the the biggest banner feature is anyone who's heard me do this uh, this talk before. We've been saying the the web report designer, web report designer. You know, it's getting up to speed with the standalone designer, getting feature parity. You know, trying to make it work exactly the same. Well, we've actually added something to the web designer now that's going to make the standalone designers a little bit jealous, and that's the the universal search box built into um, the web designer. Um, this lets you, as you can see in this little image here, search within the report for pretty much anything. It's really truly universal because when you start typing, it's going to find, it's going to find matching wizards and templates for things like uh, the SQL data source. It's going to find matching properties for items that are actually in your report. So if you have a text box um, or a number of text boxes and you want to adjust the visibility, you don't have to go through a property tree, just type the word visible, and it's gonna find every visible property on different items that you can use um, in your report. It'll, so it's a great way to sort of jump right to exactly what you need. And you can see here in the image too, you get a little bit of a um, breadcrumb built in. So you can see, um, uh, in this case, image data, uh, there are two different image data properties on different items in the report. This lets you know exactly which one you're targeting. So no, you know, clicking on items, drilling through property menus, trying to go three levels deep and find the right item. You know, this is definitely a way to shortcut um, all of that. And I haven't had a chance to use it a lot in, in um, actual report design, but I can see where this is going to be, you know, a super time saver. So are you saying this is now available only on the web report designer? This is currently available only on the web report designer. Oh, the burn, the burn. Uh, so uh, I, I'm old school. Like I, I have used our reporting solutions, like testing, uh, you know, you know, the standalone ones uh, on desktop uh, as a, you know, as a Windows app, as, as well as inside of Visual Studio. But it's been incredible, like Rick said, to see everything that we can now do just on uh, on the web itself. You can design. You can give your users the access to you know design their reports entirely. Uh, through your web application, which is incredible. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. A uh, couple of questions here from the chat room before we get started. Um, will this be available somewhere? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we are recording in you know, as high definition as the internets will allow. And we put this up on YouTube so you can come and catch us and you know leave comments. Um, yeah, this may be something Nelly and Rick, you, you folks may want to uh, talk about. So uh, and I, I think we... we you know, tread uh, on this. Uh, we, we don't, you know, um, uh, talk about other solutions too much. We want to stand on what we are doing. But, you know, if uh, compared to like SQL Server reporting or Crystal reporting, if you want to move over uh, any, you know, migrate any of this stuff, uh, uh, Nelly and Rick, what, what are your thoughts? Well, specifically on SQL Server reporting services, which is, you know, the, the, the question that was asked, um, there is no direct migration pathway um, because it is is very much i mean we say apples apples oranges oranges that's kind of like battleships to oranges it's it, the, the object model is completely different i mean there is no formal object modeling um for reports in ssrs so migration really is something that's possible and if we did find a way to shoehorn it in the result coming out would need so much uh, retuning you might as well just start it from scratch anyway um there is some limited migration for for crystal reports, but that's a whole other topic, which uh, which we can get into yeah. at some point. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so we have a universal search box. What else? Well, uh, so we also have more organization built into the reporting and web report designer. So we found that. Um, people were building a lot of reports and it sort of became a little a little untenable to have you know, 100, 200, 300 reports in one folder. So we sort of introduced this native um, built-in uh, fi um, file explorer and um, native support for folder structures into the into reporting. And this is supported both in the um, 
the web report designer, the standalone designer, and and uh, report server. So not, it's not not a a one, a one trick feature, but this lets you have um, folders uh, in you know in in subfolders and subfolders for your reports. Better organization. You can see that those are now rendered in this new UI component, which we're seeing in this image here. Um, so you can navigate folders, you can find different reports, and just help you with your organization and uh, categorization of your reports. So I know that yeah, was a, a long requested feature. And I think we, um, we actually got the you know, dog foods and nice uh, Kendo file export components, which I think are relatively new um, uh, in, you know, in this process. So you know, get to bring, uh, get, the, get the band back together. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure if you and Nelly can answer this. Uh, and I think it depends on a few things. But in the chat room, Har uh, Harlem Hale, if I'm saying that right, uh, is asking, my report server is built onto a third party partner site. Is there a way to access the web report designer with it? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, so um, I don't know what the relationship is with the third party, but uh, the web designer is built into report server. It does have to be turned on um, mm. by an administrator, though. It isn't defaultly um, turned That's on. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, I, mean, I mean, if 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 you have it in house, like you can roll it in, you can customize the the web report designer, and and you can actually host the you know the RESTful endpoint that delivers the report designer experience. But if it's hosted somewhere else, like Rick is saying, like you may need to have it turned on. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so well, it's I mean, available. Yeah. So talk to the admin, ask him to turn yeah. on that feature. It's in right. um, it's in house so. set, settings configuration. <laughs> mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, uh, let's right. see. So, have you talked about in any other? Is this the first session, Sam? Have you talked about with the um, the Kendo theming yet? No, no. You you go for it. Okay, well, I don't want to ruin anything for the you know the Kendo people that are coming up, but uh, they they, yeah. they did their thing yesterday. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. Perfect. So we get yeah. So um. A lot has changed with uh, with theming. A lot of unification. You know, the Kendo UI theming is evolving into new, um, more uh, sassy. You know, uh, sassy styles, and um, they, um, in order to you know unify everything, uh, telework reporting and the, the many different front end report viewers now support the the latest Kendo UI theming. So as you adopt to the new themes and and migrate your applications. Um, Reporting can come right along with you, and you can have that same look and feel in your report viewers, you know, right across the board. Okay. So that's always good to have that sort of that consistent, you know, UI, you know, in, in your application. So if you were building a web app um, and you want your um, reports to kind of inherit some of the styling, maybe it's you know, it's a line of business. Uh, oh. app and you know, and 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 have the report designer honor all of the Kendo UI uh, styles. Yes, yes, absolutely. So you can reuse those styles and um, have one set of styles to load. Uh, so everything is everything is great there. You froze for for half a second, Sam, but uh, yeah, I got no, the gist of what yeah. you're saying. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, yeah, something is happening with the pipes maybe today. The internet <laughs> pipes. Yeah, we'll see. It's the gremlins. Yes, yeah, the gremlins. Oh, and this uh, so this slide is giving away something I was gonna I was gonna drop as a as a surprise, but um, yes, we do have we have support for .NET seven preview now, which if uh, we'll get a chance to look at that live, I think. Wow, you're 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 a brave brave man. Uh, like we we try uh, you know staying on the cutting edge, but uh, this is really uh, out there because like .NET seven uh, is is being uh, cooked as we speak right now. It's coming out in November of 2022. Uh, so I think we're up to like preview three or preview two, maybe. Um, so that's, preview three. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there we go. So that's really, you know, forward facing for us. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the .NET sides, like, um, you know, for developers, like we can, you know, have these things coexist, but uh, uh, it's it's really, you know, uh, and I think like Misha has some things to show off as well for just Mox. So it just kind of shows you that we are, Really on the bleeding edge, trying to you know be as ready as you want to be with uh, .NET seven. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, I'm half brave, Sam. So I have two solutions <laughs> ready to go. Uh, this one is actually quite unconventional for me, and I'm using the provided um, examples uh, that came with um, came with the solution. I got some feedback last time that. Uh, 
you know, people wanted to see the, the code that I was using and it was something that I threw together myself. So this yeah. is something that's available for everybody. Um, so you download, download mm -hmm. the newest, uh, newest trials. Mm -hmm. So before you, um, you know, start going through uh, what you are showing here, uh, two things here. First is you may want to bump up your fonts because they are looking like hieroglyphics. And then while you're doing that, we can try answering uh, a couple of questions here from the chat room. Uh, WK Walter is asking, is there a way to manage reports? So some are shared and some are private to specific users. For example, can a user grab a shared report and make specific changes for their needs, leaving the shared report unmodified? Um, I want to say yes, but I'll, I'll let uh, Nelly uh, and Rick <laughs> speak to this. Uh, that's that's definitely possible. It does require a, a little bit of um, of architecting, you know, to sort of build build those um, workflows. So this all comes down to that authentication that we talked about earlier, and managing resources on the server, and um, what permissions users have based on the groups that they're in. So it's a lot. So probably more than half of this goes outside of what comes sort of in the reporting package and more into broader application design and architecture. But yes, since reports are just resources and resources are managed via the framework and the application, um, you can control access to those resources in you know, many different ways. Um, so sort of role-based um, permissions. And you know, just as a little, little uh, note, this is all built into report server. That's one of the things That's that- That's what I was gonna yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. We, we went ahead and pre-built so that individual user-based, um, role-based permission system. That's how I know it's possible because we've done it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well said. And um, another question here, uh, even drum. Uh, oh, this is this is good because we were actually thinking about this, uh, and I think um, the reporting team has maybe a question uh, uh, for our webinar. Um, so uh, when we uh, let your users create reports, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it comes down to how do we deliver them? What platforms can you view them on? And it's pretty much everything you know, uh, mobile or desktop or uh, web that you can think of. Um, but uh, the question is, uh, if you are building something offline, uh, I mean, the, the report still needs to get access to your data sources to, yes. you know, pull, pull the data and build the report. As long as you have that, I mean, the report can be generated um, with, uh, with the reporting engine. Um, now delivering it to uh, to a Windows app like uh, that that depends like if it's you know WinForms or WPF we got that but I think uh, if the question was a .NET Maui app which is you know still not out of the gate yet uh, we're looking at end of May uh, or hopefully in, the, in about ten days .NET Maui comes out uh, production ready for GA it is already production ready with you know some of the release candidates so I think the team is looking into it uh, if I'm quoting that right Rick so in terms of another viewer. Uh, I think the team is looking to see if there is interest in um, building a .NET Maui um, viewer for the reports. I'm, uh, yeah, I know it's something we're investigating. I, I can't give anything away, but um, I would be, uh, I would be paying attention to our uh, our, our roadmap in the near term. Um, there you go. Now, is there a uh, you're you're the Maui expert, Sam? Is there a web view mm. in in Maui that can render HTML and and just and JavaScript. That's, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. Okay, yeah. so uh, even John, to answer your question, you can actually do this right now uh, without even like a formal viewer. So if you have any type of web app, right, be it Angular, be it React, be it Vue, be it Blazor, ASP.NET, we got you covered. As long as there's a web view, we can render our reports just fine. And .NET Maui turns out has a very very good web view abstraction. It knows which platform you're running on: iOS, Android, Windows, or Mac. And that's exactly how, like, in fact, Blazor runs on top of .NET Maui. So just render it on the web view. You got you got it right now. Uh, so you don't even need like a Windows or a Mac specific viewer because the web view is good enough. So you can do this right now. That that's why I would do it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Rick. I know you are itching to get into your demo. Oh, <laughs> well, speaking of the of the viewer, I mean that's what we have, you know, right here. So this is this is the code that you would you would implement uh, in Maui or in any web app to have a um, simple lightweight HTML5 JavaScript, JavaScript um, jQuery based um, front end viewer. And don't don't you know frantically start taking notes. This is all on our website. You can just copy and paste all of this. Um, there's more comments in here than, than actual code, so this is uh, so props to the engineering team who actually enjoys uh, writing comments for for people out here. Um, 
So all of this is available, you know, on the website. But I'm just gonna um, just quickly I want to just explore the the solution explorer real quick, and then we're gonna run it because you know that's what people want to see. But under this one, you know, sort of large solution, you know, let's look at the folders here. We have uh, .NET five, .NET six, .NET Core three one. .NET Framework. We have some um, abstracted business objects, which is you know, definitely the way to build your business objects nowadays, um, and some other you know solution-related items. But um, and then within each within each uh, folder, we have um, a bunch of different projects. So let's look at you know these um, namespaces: um, C Sharp, obviously C Sharp based. .NET Five Blazor integration demo, HTML Five integration demo, reporting REST services cores demo. So that's something we get a lot of questions about. How to cores, uh, WinForms integration, and WPF integration. So all of this comes sort of like pro provided for you. So whenever you're getting started, you know, find your you know your framework of choice. On five in my case, uh, find your demo that you want to run. HTML Five integration demo. Make this your loading project click the the big green button and everything should sort of just launch automatically under that project you really have all of the and of course it's going to launch a different monitor um, we have all of the integration code that you need for your application so you can see how everything kind of connects and comes together um, on its own did i, did I freeze uh, your camera looks a little frozen but we can still can you hear you? Oh. Wait, did all of us freeze? No, I, th I can still see myself move. This is... Uh... This is interesting. How can all of you freeze together? No, I, Misha is moving. Peter is moving. Nelly is moving. It's only Rick. There we go. <laughs> uh, okay, so we lost Rick because, uh, okay, so how did my little say is we can still hear you. Okay, so I think it was um, Rick who was freezing. <laughs> oh, our good friend Aaron is here. Hello. Uh, yeah, don't do a local host. Hey. Who, who needs uh, who needs enemies when we are friends like Aaron pulling our leg? Hey, it's all it's all good. We're we're living on the edge here, local host, and uh, why not? Why not? Um, all right. So um, how about we give uh, Rick some time to come back and maybe uh, pick up on reporting? Peter, um, do you want to switch gears? Yeah, and you're you're on mute. So if you are. Uh, that was a note Absolutely. to sell. Okay. Yeah, I, I do. It's already getting a little bit late Friday afternoon, beautiful weekend yeah. coming here in Sofia, Bulgaria. So, <laughs> I, and I should have yeah. mentioned that. So, uh, we are kind of all over the place. So, um, we had Eve with us, who uh, uh, is on the East Coast time with me and, and Rick, but everybody else, Peter, Misho, and Nelly are all in beautiful Sofia, Bulgaria. And it's like late Friday evening. It's almost uh, you know, time to start drinking, maybe. Uh, so <laughs> why don't we, yeah, almost. Why don't we let uh, Rick come back and you know finish up on reporting. And Peter, if you are ready to switch gears, share your desktop and Definitely. talk a little bit about testing. So let's see what we can show today do i have my elevator pitch for what test studio is yeah absolutely and let me uh, bring up your desktop while we're doing that there you go we see it uh so Thank yes what much. is test studio yeah all right uh so my elevator pitch starts ding ding uh it's <laughs> it's the lyric solution for complete ui automation i say complete ui automation because if we're talking about web ui it doesn't matter what kind of application, what kind of uh, front end that you have. As long as it runs in a browser, in uh, the popular browsers that exist out there, we're going to recognize it. As long as we recognize it, we're going to automate it. Simple as that. Plus, of course, any type of WPF application that exists uh, out there would be automated too. And uh, Test Studio also brings additional benefits like voting performance testing, RESTful API testing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, responsive testing and, um, and whatnot. It's a point and click recorder, meaning that I know we have gathered a bunch of developers uh, today here in the audience, but 
to create tests with Test Studio, you don't have to write a single line of code. Of course, if you want, if you're fluent in C Sharp or VP.NET, you can unleash your skills and create fully automated code tests. But we give you the ability to use our point and click recorder and just mimic the behavior of your end users in order to create a test, which later on you can execute, schedule, plug into your CI CD solutions, and um, enjoy your flawless um, applications. Yeah, and I really like the fact that, I mean, you work with just about every type of web app, but if you happen to be using uh, our UI, you know, any sort of Telerica or Kindle UI, then the automation works that much better because you know exactly the components that we render. Absolutely. Yeah, this happens thanks to the so-called uh, translators. And actually, our tools do talk uh, to each other, right? We are a UI components provider, but we also provide solutions for testing, mocking, debugging, design, reporting. You know, and those guys, those separate products talk to each other. The design system talks to the UI components, the UI components uh, talk to testing tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every time we recognize an application which is built with uh, Teleric UI, and again, it doesn't matter whether it's Kendo UI, Teleric UI, web or desktop UI components, we recognize them thanks to the so-called translators, right? And if I'm to explain translators quickly, these are the so-called special, think of them as special extensions. And let me bring you a beautiful screenshot here. Later on, I'm going to show you during the demo. But if we have this little grid here, right, which is a candle grid, and whatever Test Studio recognizes our own component within an application, we give you automatically the ability to create quick actions and verifications without the necessity to do anything else. Uh, let's say, is my drop down list open? Is my grid sorted? How many data items do I have in my data grid? All of this comes out of the box and can be verified because we talk to each other, our products talk to each other. And thanks to those translators. Yeah, makes sense. And this is actually some, which is, uh, this is the main highlight of today's, uh, this release of uh, Test Studio R2 2020. We, uh, of course, the translators have been here for quite some time, right? But the little difference is that we have introduced versioning of our translators. And what do I mean by versioning and why do we need this versioning? Rick, by the way, has a very beautiful blog post on why you should update or why you shouldn't update your application, right? We're not talk going to talk about this blog nowadays, but you know that uh, it's not absolutely necessary to always update your application. It's just very recommended, but sometimes Sometimes uh, it's not possible. Sometimes you have breaking changes introduced with each of the updates. Sometimes your developers are on vacation in Maui, right? Uh, no pun intended here with, uh, with the wording, right? And, and sometimes you need to just slow down a little bit, give yourself time and do the updates gradually, which can avoid conflicts between your QA environments and your development environments. Test Studio as a tool, used to be compatible always from day zero with the latest versions of our UI components. Hence, the translators were always updated, right? Which potentially created such conflicts for some breaking changes. This was, by the way, we are a customer feedback driven uh, team here in Test Studio. We received a lot of customer feedback about doing something about that and Based on that, we decided to introduce versioning of those uh, translators. What do I mean by that? Uh, we're going to see it during the demos, but if I'm going to pull another screenshot here from our online documentation, with the latest version of Test Studio, you can go from the different project settings and test list settings and select the corresponding UI component version, you know, the same versions R1, R2, R3, and create, record, execute and schedule the tests according to this version. Uh, we receive a lot of questions. All right, good. Uh, I can pick up R3, R1, uh, whatever, but how do I actually know which version I am using? No worries for that. It is well indexed in our online documentation. All you need to do is uh, click on the corresponding link here from Test Studio, which will bring you up the documentation article where you can compare the different naming conventions 
for the UI components version, which corresponds to the translator version. And the rest is just sit down, enjoy, and uh, do your testing. Yeah, this is this is cool. And, and, and naming is hard. Numbering and uh, semantic versioning is hard, as we know. But absolutely. To, to your point, like you could um, essentially have different versions then in different environments, right? Maybe you want to mm -hmm. switch just the dev part, um, and then you know for QA mm -hmm. and production, you're still having a different version. You're just like, like you said, like slowly rolling out um, an update. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this is what I'm going to show you now, guys. I have several uh, different environments now with uh, the different uh, versions available. Uh, here, of course, we're not going to go through all of the versions here. I just want to show you the basics and how you can utilize uh, those guys. And if you're all ready, we can pull up a quick test studio demo here. Let me just... Sure, go. Uh, to on the screen. So basically what I have uh, prepared are three different uh, environments here in terms of three different uh, projects. And this is, by the way, how Test Audio looks like for the for the guys who see it for the first time. It exists, just a quick uh, note here, it exists as a standalone tool uh, which you can install on your premises, but it also exists as a Visual Studio plugin, right? Meaning that if you want, you it's not necessary to switch context and you can stay within your favorite IDE right, and still manage uh, and run and create and edit your UI tests. Uh, what I'm showing uh, today is the standalone version of um, uh, the tool. And I have a project which runs against an environment. Here you can see my base URL. Um, not sure if it is zoomed well enough, but anyways, uh, this is an environment which hosts uh, the last release from 2021 or the so-called uh, Telerik uh, R3 release, right? And I have uh, included a bunch of um, uh, UI components here, can do UI components. I'm going to show you the grid and uh, the input, how to check the version and set the versions for the translators. Actually, this is what the new, the new release, the new version introduces. You simply go to settings right, and into the translator's version of, uh, translator's portion of the settings, you have the ability to first switch on, switch off all of the translators for the different uh, technologies. Of course, by default, they're switched uh, on, and I highly recommend you keep it uh, that way. You can drill down to a very specific component translator and switch it on and off if you want it. But as I said, just keep them as uh, they are, switched on uh, by default. And from here, from this little dropdown, you can select the corresponding version. Currently, we have versioning since uh, end of 2021 till latest and uh, greatest. Um, of course, this is on project level. And for the guys who are, who are familiar with Test Studio already and how test scheduling and execution is done, uh, you already know that we execute our tests by means of the so-called test lists. Think of them as containers, which contain the different uh, tests within them, which you can um, schedule and execute locally, remotely, plug into your CI/CD environments and whatnot. And those test lists, they have settings of their own, which can, can or cannot, depending on how you configure them, override the global project settings. So no matter what you have set up here into the project settings, I have selected for translators version R3 to correspond to my environment, right? But you can go to a separate test list of your choice, select the test list, oops, sorry, select the test list, select its settings, and from the first available tab, the general settings, you can check and change the version or override the project setting for this particular test list. Uh, only so I can select the latest, for example, right? So pretty, uh, pretty much uh, flexibility, a lot of flexibility yeah, here yeah. that you have. And I, I uh, like the fact that you have like project level and also being able to drill down to a specific, you know, test run. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this might be a silly question, but like what, what you're choosing here version wise, like uh, that 
uh, this doesn't impact if you're running the test actually headless, right? Or maybe inside of like Correct. a Docker container. Correct. Correct. It doesn't uh, doesn't alter this fact. And indeed, by the way, it's a good remark here, Sam. Uh, the settings that can be overridden per test list are not only for the translators. Basically, any type of setting, including including the desired browser and the desired browser mode that we want to run our test list in. I may record my test in Edge or Chrome uh, or um, Firefox, but I can schedule and execute a specific test list to run in the headless mode of Chrome, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'll plug it into my Docker, a Docker container. Right. I see. So this uh, is a kind of independent of each other. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, take a quick pause to answer some questions here. Uh, right. First question here is here for you, Peter. Um, Obrox is asking Test Studio and the Test Studio that's included in like the Visual Studio uh, as compared mm -hmm. to the standalone thing. Are there differences? There are. Uh, there are differences into the features that are available into the different editions of uh, Test Studio as a standalone tool. First, we start with the standalone tool. Uh, the additional benefits that it brings is that it allows you, to, uh, we ship it with our own scheduling and execution services and servers uh, and a little bit of MongoDB. By the way, so it allows you, the standalone app application, it allows you to actually be independent of any CI CD solutions and run everything yourself from the creation of the test to the scheduling and uh, the execution. Right. This portion is not available into the Visual Studio plugin. Right. Uh, apart from that, the standalone version allows you to create different types of load and performance testing. Uh, how would my application behave if it is under a load of 1,000 concurrent users, for example, or 10,000 concurrent uh, users, uh, God bless your uh, application, right? This is something that you can check with uh, load and performance testing um, in Test Studio. And of course, your RESTful, RESTful API can be edited um, as well. These features also only exist in two extent one version. The core feature, the functional, the functional testing, the translators that we're seeing uh, uh, today, all of uh, them are shipped into every edition of Test Studio that exists out there. Okay, okay, good to know. And um, I can't highlight this easily, but I will read this out because like we're also streaming to uh, to YouTube and I can't see the questions very easily or like I can't highlight them, but mm -hmm. I can see them. So uh, Misho and Peter, this may be a question for both of you because I had to actually mm -hmm. look up what uh, this was. So Bob uh, Weram, if I'm saying it right, uh, is asking if Telerik will ever support the ADA programming language. And I think ADA is um, pretty old school compared to like, I think it came out right around like C++ days. Uh, have you folks uh, heard of this? Uh, do you know anything about this? I personally haven't, as far as the domain of testing uh, is concerned. Uh, you know, we are a pure .NET uh, tool there, and uh, we live on C Sharp and uh, maybe .NET. So as far as this is concerned, we don't have any plans to introduce. Yeah, I would say the same for just Mo just Mo is .NET tool, and it's working with C Sharp and uh, VB. So I'm not sure how the ADA programming language will fit in that narrative. And C++ as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, we uh, we sometimes, like, we, we may joke about this, like, we, we, have, we have a service called Hugs as a service for, uh, you know, everyone having to maintain, like, IE6 compatibility or having to do COBOL or C++ or... Uh, ADA for that matter, but again, whatever is running your business, uh, I, I think like we have to, you know, cater to our masses of where most developers are, uh, you know, with uh, .NET and C Sharp and JavaScript. So that's where we are at as well. Absolutely. Um, by the way, Sam, I see that we're going a little bit ahead of um, our time. So if you allow me, just a very quick fast forward. I already started execution one of the the tests oh, yeah, here yeah, yeah, against um, a versioning. Um, what I'm going to quickly show you, all of you guys, is um, I didn't run the entire test. I just ran the option, which is called in test studio run to here, which allows you to both be in recording and execution mode, meaning that we are completely live at the moment. I just uh, 
executed my script up to a specific point, right? And this specific point is uh, can do grid, which at the moment has a state of being grouped by category, right? With the help of those translators and from our recorder highlighter, uh, when it's switched on, you know, we identify all of the elements on the screen. And if you see some colorful icons, it means that we recognize our own family, right? Orange is for the candle, to meaning that we recognize our candle grid in this case, or the specific portions um, and other elements of, uh, of it. But in the case, uh, I'm hovering over the grid and you can see those additional benefits that we give you if you're using both the Studio and the UI, the UI components. As you can see, I can add very quick action steps uh, and verification steps. I can verify that I have 20 items within the grid and I do have 20 items in the grid here, which are displayed, right? I can very quickly verify, oops, sorry, I'm too quick. I can quickly verify if the grid at the moment is groupable. Uh, if it is uh, sorted by some uh, criterion or if it is grouped by some criterion, right? And I have such verification, right? Verify that the candle grid is grouped by category name and it is grouped by category name. So these are all of the additional benefits that Test Studio gives you when you use the same, the same technology on the UI components in Test Studio. Yeah, I like it. Right. I like how it's like orange and separately color coded. Like you, your family, we we know you. It, it, it's like uh, when you go to a restaurant. Sometimes there's like a there are hidden items on the menu that you don't see unless you are a regular, unless you're a family. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, uh, what else? Uh, let me see if I can run this quickly. Uh, I can run only a specific step from my script when I am in recording mode. And now if everything works fine, we should see a failing test. And let's see if the test was failing. Yep, the test was failing because I wanted to make sure I changed the verification logic uh, from the grid being grouped by category from is to is not. And obviously our grid is grouped by category. So my test failed. And my translators work fine, my environment works fine, my streaming connection works fine. And I think it was a very nice uh, demo today for Test Studio. <laughs> right. Although it's Friday 13th, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Today>. <laughs> it is indeed May 13th, yeah. Um, yeah. What, is, what is the uh, vertical thing that it's highlighting? I wanted to ask you um, back oh, on yeah. your app. Yeah, what is that? This one. So this is a recorder that oh, is provided by by test studio you can uh, move it oh, you, you can, can make move it around. horizontal okay, okay. yeah you can make it horizontal so it uh, clears some uh, real estate it allows right. you uh, by default the high is switched off but when you switch it on the most important feature you know we recognize every element on the screen and this is actually how test studio uh, test studio works in order to automate your application guys we need to recognize the elements on the screen and in order to recognize them if you go to the settings we're looking for their attributes. This is how Test Studio does its uh, automation. This is how our framework works, right? We're looking by default for the element ID. If we cannot find it, we're looking for the name. If we cannot find it, we're looking for the source, href, and whatever. Don't worry. I know how painful dynamic IDs might be, and I know how your automation can break, and you can a little bit cry, uh, maybe. So if you have a lot of dynamic IDs in your uh, application, tell Test Studio not to use IDs by hovering over the option and bring it to the bottom of the screen so we don't care about IDs at all. And maybe we recognize your elements by name first, or even better, uh, if you have some custom tags, some area labels or whatever, add them, talk to your developers, talk to the developers, to the QAs, see what's the most stable, what's the most stable element in your application, add it, and I promise you, automation will be a little bit much easier than uh, than before uh, if you do that, right? Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. So yeah, so this uh, translator versioning thing is brand new in, in this release. Absolutely, already available. Check if you have uh, if you haven't updated uh, your instance of Test Studio, 
yet doesn't matter stand alone only visual studio and do enjoy the updates yeah and uh, um, yes. yeah last release i was uh yeah look at that software is all up to date last release i was super impressed with some of your demos with you know running things like you you, you have your testing but then running it in a ci cd uh workflow and you showed off some things with like docker and you know other headless uh testing scenarios those are all still good to go with uh, what, what we have here absolutely uh fully supported with uh, with that as long as there is a browser we recognize the application as long as we recognize the application we automate it and as long as it's telemetric ui we automate it as well regardless of the environment uh, and very trans yeah yeah all right makes sense very cool so anything else with uh test studio that you want to talk about peter uh or? there were yeah there were some when you uh let me actually pull there's some minor tweaks, but as I said, we're listening to our customers uh, a lot. Some additional minor tweaks uh, into the how we search and automate um, the elements. Um, there are a bunch of settings within the tool. I won't uh, bother you guys with uh, the details and to sh uh, showing you uh, them, but uh, they just deserve to be mentioned because um, it was a pretty popular request uh, by our uh, customers first uh, we have um, we have changed our compare mode uh, from full path and query and actually yeah you can see it in my screen from full path and query to full path uh, I and my colleagues personally think um, the queries in the URLs are not the same are not the same like uh, they used to be right so we decided to remove the query part and the default compare mode is full path of course you can always go back to full path and query if you want but uh, by default we're using full path um, uh, for uh, comparison right and uh, if you have drop downs that you need to to automate each of the values each of the values within those uh, those drop downs would be recorded used to be recorded up until now by value and today uh, they will be recorded uh, by text why am i saying that because depending on your application we cannot know all of our customers applications but uh, it seems that text seems to be a little bit more stable not changing than by value uh, and again this this is just a default setting we are not removing anything you can change it back from the test your settings at any point of time this is done solely for easing your life when you do ui automation right yeah um, that's it one more question here and i think i know the answer mm -hmm. but i'll let you speak to this can the automated tests be run automatically with a workflow on github actions for example so so we have speak yeah <laughs> thanks a very good question so by default test studio integrates with a bunch uh, with a bunch of um environments uh, right J you know jenkins uh, devops in city bump and whatnot uh if you ask me can we just plug and play into those no gitlab but the way test studio lists work is that they can be executed uh by means of your command line right it, i'm not sure if i have enough time to show you uh but from the coi you can always pull up you can navigate your test studio installation folder and um, bring up our exe and then uh tell it to run a test list right so as long as you can put this into your gitlab via script or something else you would be able to run to schedule and run uh, your tests as part of your builds there as well, right? That's what I'm saying that it doesn't have this automatic uh, plug and play integration like with uh, Azure DevOps or Jenkins, right? But it's pretty popular. We have it as uh, on our roadmap in order to enhance uh, this as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one last question here for you, Peter. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm putting you in the spot, but if you go back to <laughs> test, test Studio, um, mm -hmm. Uh, no, I mean, not, not the app running, but just, yeah. Is there a, a dark mode in here? 
Absolutely, there is. Um, you can change it from the settings. However, some I need to. No, you, you don't have to switch. Start. I was just asking yeah. if, you, if you do. Yeah, we absolutely have a dark well, and light a theme. theme. There you available. go. Right, ah. there we go. Um, but That's the changes cool. we go quite. <laughs> we'll be applied after test the result. And by the way, I forgot to say that. Apologies. If you change the versioning of the translators, it will also be applied okay, after, after yeah, the yeah. studio restart. So sometimes it's good to restart your applications. You know, you you you're still in the chat room because like somebody else in the chat room was complaining about <laughs> so, how you um, somebody's being forced into light mode. <laughs> but there you go. You can you can switch. Definitely. Yeah. All right. <laughs> cool. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. This is, uh, this is good stuff. Always, uh, always good mm -hmm. to see us uh, push on the automation side of things, uh, you know, and, you know, bringing uh, testing and DevOps all part of one cycle, um, you know, um, for developers. And I know it's Friday the 13th. Uh, so, uh, and then Misha has been uh, waiting to show off mocking, uh, but looks like Rick might be back. Rick, I'm going to bring you up if you are. How many times has your computer blue screen today? Uh, <laughs> I lost screen. count at six. I, I, I honestly lost count at six. Yeah, Friday the 13th. Yeah. 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 There we go. I, I, I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> today I have turned off every resource I can. My virtual background is now gone. Um, I have absolutely everything turned off that can be turned off because it seems like when my cpu gets around 85 percent the computer decides that it's 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 a friday and it's not working <laughs> I, I don't know why you had a virtual background i love your little bookcase <laughs> in the back uh okay so um misha you're still around oh and misha took his camera off for a second but i was gonna uh maybe let you go first because i know it's you know getting late evening for you so let me know, Misha, if you want to go. And uh, Peter, if you're done, I'm going to bring your uh, desktop down. And Misha probably left for drinks. It's too too late for him. OK, then, uh, Rick, you can go if you are uh, if you want to give this another shot. OK, uh, I, I the show. only thing I have to do is share my screen. I just need one thing to work without crashing. <laughs> I preloaded everything. <laughs> Oh, there's Misha is back. Uh, oh. So, uh, Misha, did you want to go? Because uh, I know it's getting late for you. No, I think. Are you good? Okay, so Rick, you get one more shot until your next okay. blue screen. Is it, did it work? Did it work? Uh, hold on, I see it. Uh, yeah, yes, there you go. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I have nothing to load, nothing to peg the CPU. So let's, let's give this a try. It, it, um, so our folks in the chat room are saying uh, <laughs> do deploy on Fridays because why not? You can you can just like you know hop off and not be able not be reachable. So it's all good. <laughs> well, I wish all the luck to everyone else. I will, I will take the hits of the Friday the thirteenth. So let's see what do we have here. <clears throat> so this is the web based um, report designer we were talking about. And it has, this is one of our reports. Um, I can preview what this looks like when it, when it renders. It looks much more impressive rendered than in its design mode. Um, so this is a very nice uh, cataloging report. But you can see here, there's quite a number of fields going on. There's some tables, a picture box, nested items, all kinds of properties on the left, all kinds of properties on the right. You have component explorers. So if you're good with reporting and you know where everything is, you know, you can, you can work with productively, but if it's something, you know, even, even myself, I forget a lot of times where a property is this new universal search bar is going to be your new best friend. So, you know, let's say we want to work with, you know, the visible property. Let's start typing viz. We start seeing, you know, the various visible properties that are available to us um, within the context, of what we've clicked on. So we have visible for the item that's in focus. And also we have a visible property under style. Uh, this is a, picture box, and I think we just call it picture box, right? Yeah, picture box one. Let's say I wanted to find that somewhere in the in the report or find all the picture boxes I can start typing. And you can see we have here picture box one, which is that specific item. And we also have the component picture box. If I wanna just create a new one and click that and it'll bring us right, right here. If you wanted to do a SQL data source, you can start typing SQL and we can see, well, this report has two SQL data sources in it that I've already set up. And here's the wizard for creating a new one if you want to do that. So this is a great shortcut um, to sort of move around the report. 
And it looks like it's using uh, mark first match and uh, auto complete, all the nice features. So yeah, this is this is really cool. And like I said, only available on the web report designer. So we sort of then, you know, design services are an interesting, interesting topic, Sam. You know, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, in a platform-based application that's still using, you know, the old Windows-based, you know, WinForms and WPF design services, it's really, really easy to implement. You know, the the, the big pillars and tools are, are done for us. <laughs> we had to do this on the web. We had pretty much had to start from scratch. I mean, we're, we're not we're not uh, building with Legos anymore. We're <laughs> we're grabbing a, a chunk of clay and sculpting the Legos first. Um, but you know we kind of tilted into the fact that there are some things that are easier to do on the web. And <laughs> this text box is a good example of that. So maybe yeah, we'll see is, some. Yeah, and this is very impressive because like, it's not only is it auto-completing and, and suggesting things, like it's actually taking you straight into a wizard if you if you choose that. It's a great shortcut, it's a great shortcut. So I'm excited to see what else, you know, sort of comes out of this, um, this uh, greater embrace of, the things that are easy to do in web tech instead of things that are hard to do. Oh, and uh, is, the plural, is the plural of Lego Lego? <laughs> I think it is. I don't know. We, we might say Legos, but yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, let's so this is the web designer. So let's pop over to our report viewer. And one of the other things I wanted to show off is we have in our demos now this nice little theme uh, theme picker. So mm. we talked about the Kendo UI themes and their full support now in in here. So you can, you can come in, you can choose the the various themes. Um, there's I know there's a big affinity for for dark mode. So is the the black theme. Um, we also have Metro Black, so you can switch over to that. Um, just a note here, the background of the report is still white because it's pixel perfect rendering. And when this report was designed, the background color was white. And and you know, we, we respect our report designers. We want the report to show the way that they they designed it. Um, so this is uh so the report background is still um, white there. But you can go and you can try, try different styles. Will this will, will this uh work? Uh, Rick, if we have like a custom uh, theme, absolutely, it will work with a a, a, a custom. It'll work with the the provided themes. It'll work with a um, say a modified theme that, that comes out of our theme builder. Um, yeah. It'll work if you just use the the variables, um, which uh, I've learned recently have many different names depending on what your design surface is. Uh, styles they're called in Figma. Um, Unite UX calls them. Uh, design tokens or um, components, uh, but yeah, so, uh, the swatches and variables um, can be updated uh, to change some of the larger, um, some of the larger styles, uh, primary and secondary colors. That will all be respected. And if you have a completely custom theme that, that you've built, uh, that will be used as well, because this is all done using sort of the best practices for um, for sassy styling. Nice. Yeah, let's go back to default here. Um, so let's see, we've talked about all the, all the reboots. I've, I've lost my train of thought a bit, uh, <laughs> which features haven't we talked about yet? Well, you, you had mentioned .NET 7, but I'm even scared of going there because it's well, way too forward facing. <laughs> you want to hear a funny story. Uh, this is my .NET 7 app um, because oh, I could really? only, I told you, I had to preload everything. I was not going to load a second application live again. So this is all running in, in uh, .NET 7. So let me go back over. And about 10 minutes before we went on the air, I built a little report, which I'm going to preview yeah. because I'm going through it, you know, kind of the other way. It gives away some of the, uh, some of the surprise, but Yep, you can click on one of our interactive report items uh, here. And yay, this is all running .NET 7 Preview 3 Visual Studio 2020 Preview latest um, wow. latest push. I think I updated this last night. So wow. it does not get any more bleeding edge than this. Can, can you show us, like, uh, this is running on localhost. So can you show us your project, like? Uh... Yes. And your uh, I, that shouldn't break anything. <laughs> CS Proj, no. Why, why so break? this is uh, this is the project, and if I go here, and... yeah, wow. .NET seven seven zero. Look at that. 
Very nice, very nice. Oh, oh now I remember uh, what I was going to ask you. So uh, back on the um, on the report, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you could you now have uh, folders to organize. Yes, yes. So let's go to the the report designer, web based report designer. Go back to the design mode, and I am going to go to uh, menu and open. So this brings us to the, the the new folder structure. You can see I only have one folder here on the on the uh, on the left called reports, but you can see that you would have multi you could have multiple folders in here. Um, I would have to rebuild this project to get more folders on the left, and I on a normal day I would do it. Today I am. <laughs> I think I'm going to hold off, but um, so if I had actually, if I had built multiple folder, a folder tree into this project, it would be shown over here. And I don't think we've talked very much about the new folder structure in the asset manager, which we talked, this is a new feature we talked about um, we, uh, in R1. This is, yeah, this was last release where we had yep. the assets manager. But this has been greatly expanded now. So this has the built-in um, folders for the resources relative mm. to your project. So you can see in my resources images folder, I have my, my little smiley icon that we were looking at before. And this is all being referenced from here. So here we do have an example of the multiple folders because the resources, this is a system, kind of a system folder for, for reporting, yeah. um, a default one at least. You can make your own if you want something more complex. Um, you can see, you know, built-in folder structure. You can navigate folders, and um, oh, I can actually create a new folder from here. Uh, so you can do new folder. Uh, hi, Sam. And oh, there we go. We have a we have a hi Sam folder, and you can save reports, you know, to this folder. So they'll be in here. And you can organize your reports differently, and I'm sure in in in. Um, subsequent releases and service packs, we'll see uh, many new features that will be added to this, like uh, maybe drag and drop from, um, you can mm -hmm. will be something that we can add. This is, this is very new. So we, now we get to, you know, talk to the, talk to the community and see what they want to see and start implementing new features based on this. It's a little, little search box here too. Uh, let's see, I haven't actually, I haven't played with this before. So let's, hey, look at that. Yeah, it's, yeah, trying to narrow it down. Nice. Yeah, that makes it even easier. Wow. So as, as a user, if you have uh, maybe like an OCD person like me who, who loves to, you know, <laughs> keep things uh, exactly where they are, like you could really get very organized, you know, have all of your assets in one spot and, you know, things that map to every reports, like your Friday TPS reports. <laughs> and yeah, so every one of your, you know, reporting uh, and the assets that go into every report can be nicely organized now all on the web. Absolutely. And I have one more feature to show off. This is a report server only, Telic report server only feature. And let's see if I can uh, if I can load this without my computer exploding. Let's see. I believe my report server is running on port eighty three. Blue screen incoming. One, two. <laughs> Maybe no, you're still holding up. It may not be the right port though. Oh yeah, there it goes. Okay, it must, that service must not have been running. So let's log in to report server. Where's my password? I had to break the very unfortunate habit of muttering my passwords as I type them when I started doing these live streams. <laughs> okay, so there's one great new feature that we've added to Telework Reporting, which it's on the screen right now. If anyone has good eyes, you can see it. That is the paging feature on the bottom here. So you can see that as your report collection grows, it's possible that you may have um, many, many reports and paging sort of makes it easier to, to work with those and visualize them all on one screen at a time. So this has sort of the built-in pager. You can select your page size and go between different pages. Very cool. Yeah. And these are, these are the same reports uh, they were looking at in R1, I think. I remember some of these. You have been into Halloween and Bond and Star Wars. And yep. other things. Rick, Rick is known for fun reports. Rick makes <laughs> reporting fun. All right. Cool, cool. Very cool. Well, um, you know, thanks. A uh, big thank you to you and the team who, you know, keeps on churning. Reporting is such a key part of, you know, uh, enterprise workflows. So more power to your end users and more power to developers. Very good stuff. Very good stuff.
All right, Rick. Anything else reporting wise? Uh, I think we've covered. Yeah, I think we've covered the major major updates. Um, so yeah, I don't have anything else that I can I can show without risking uh, <laughs> risking pandemonium. Well, you you came back from six blue screens, and, and here you are. <laughs> All right, uh, Misha, are you ready to switch gears? Yeah. All right, so Misha is our expert on all things mocking for developers because you know unit testing and uh, you know mocking is important for you to have confidence in the code that you're pushing out. So uh, I see your desktop, Misha. So all right, we're up and running. Tell me what is just mock up front. So just mock uh, is a mocking framework uh, that will help you write faster in your unit test and will help you isolate uh, better the, cost, the, the, the code that you want to test. Uh, in essence, that's it, what just mock is. OK. All right. Now, what have you been doing uh, since R1 to R2, or have you been on vacation the entire four months? No, not really. Uh, actually, <laughs> we were fixing some stuff related to uh, .NET 7, and uh, we were implementing a few features. So See, all, all of you folks are way too uh, ahead of the curve. Like, slow down. You're already on .NET 7. I'm still grappling with, like, .NET 6. But, you know, you, you, <laughs> yeah. you have to move well, fast. Well, .NET 6 is, was uh, last year, so we are already uh, supported. And yeah, the new thing is .NET 7. So we want to make sure that we we support it uh, when it's uh, released. And this is why we, we start to add the implementation with the preview versions. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, .NET 7, it's uh, one of the things uh, we uh, have been working on uh, generating uh, mock arrangements inside the, uh, the uh, Visual Studio. And um, a feature that uh, was uh, lacking uh, in just mock was uh, the ability to mock uh, an interface default implementation. And we also have uh, released that as well. I can actually show it now. Yeah. So before you do, uh, a quick pointer here from the chat room. Like, uh, you know, I was talking about being on .NET 6. Uh, I do a lot of like .NET MAUI stuff. It still works on .NET 6. But the reality is for a lot of enterprises, you are still running web forms. You are on .NET Framework. So um, everything that you're showing here, this should also, or I mean, .NET Framework is where you started, right? With just mock. So this should yeah. all work on yeah. .NET Framework. Absolutely. Actually, uh, probably 70% of our clients are using .NET Framework. So there everything that we show is working with uh, .NET Framework. Uh, but since .NET Framework is not actively developed and right. .NET yeah, Core to, is, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we yeah. need to look ahead. And uh, when our yeah. clients decide to migrate uh, to .NET yeah. Core, we so, need to support it. Absolutely. So certainly, Dave, you're not alone. This is the reality for most enterprises. And uh, Misha, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Uh, can you please bump up your fonts? Yeah, of course. Uh, you're telling me the time. <laughs> I'm presenting them. <laughs> I, I there you go. Now we can read it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, OK. So I will start, actually, with the default uh, interfaces. Uh, as you can see, there is some interface here that uh, we have a very simple uh, method which multiplies two values and in one of the tests it's, uh, we are just uh, testing the um, the functionality if if it works uh, correctly and in the next one uh, we are creating a mock of uh, a class that is actually uh, inheriting that interface and uh, we are making the arrangement and that arrangement will essentially say uh, that the multiply values method should return 10 and by doing this if you have uh, some dependency on such a uh, such in, uh, implementation then you can mock it and uh, return any value that you want or make it to something different or you could actually call the original value and uh, just uh, record that uh, this method has been uh, executed so what i will do is uh, so let me understand this 
Misha, yeah. I was going to ask, like, so if if you have an interface which has a default implementation, yeah. but then you have, uh, um, uh, you know, other um, inheriting methods have their own implementation, you're saying now you want to mock the default uh, implementation of that interface. Yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah, you you can do that. You can you can mock everything you would like. But uh, in this specific um, example, I'm showing that uh, the, the default implementation of the interface. And uh, yeah, if you if you have uh, uh, another uh, implementation in the full object, then of course this can uh, this can be done. Uh, and yeah, then, well, that's it. And the the mock is created like uh, every other uh, mock arrangement is created. Essentially, you're calling the range you are using the method that you would like to mock, and then you're doing some action which will be return or original or something different. So now I will build and start the tests. Those are actually the examples that are delivered with the just mock. Right. We are waiting the test to be executed, and as you can see, the tests are already being executed. So, meaning that this works, yeah. So, the next thing is that we've worked uh, on generating uh, mock arrangements from within Visual Studio. That was one of the uh, requested features uh, uh, from our yearly survey to our customers. And uh, this is uh, what we have done. Essentially, we can go on a specific class and call the uh, quick action menu and there uh, you have the create mock uh, button which will generate the creation of the mock for that particular class you can copy the, that code and you can insert it oh wait what this wait this first. this is uh, this is new right uh, like you are actually integrating into the visual studio light bulb itself that context menu yeah it's integrated in, inside visual studio yes nice yeah, you can you can copy the uh, the code and uh, you can use it, and uh, of course it will this will work on any other mm. method that is called. And um, at this point is a bit uh, I would say uh, have a bit limited functionality in terms that it does not support still generics and uh, ref in and ref out parameters, but um, I think that in, uh, in the next release we will uh, support those as well. But yeah, this was uh, one of the most requested features because some of the people, they just don't want to write that stuff. Uh, yeah. Why would you write uh, <laughs> code when you can copy paste it? Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, that's the, the how professional developers work. We are experts at copy and pasting. Yeah, yeah. Good. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, what we are doing in as a generic vehicle. And the last thing that uh, I want to show is uh, the support for .NET 7. And if I open yeah, here, here it comes. Here the project, you can see that we are working with the .NET 7. Oh, this uh, was running on .NET 7. Yeah, this was actually a .NET wow. 7. Wow, all right, all right, okay. Yeah, and yeah, with the next uh, preview versions, we will continue working and uh, supporting. Yeah, good for you, good for you to be forward you know, facing. Uh, oh, and uh, Shmuel York, uh, hello, hello, good to see uh, uh, our friends here. Uh, but yeah, and, and like we're talking about, like I think the reality uh, is still maybe for lots of enterprises, it is .NET framework. Maybe you have you have considered moving on to .NET Core. You got three point one, you got five, you got six, and for folks like Misho who have to support developers across the board, you have to look uh, ahead, and you have to look at uh, the previews uh, of .NET seven coming out. Um, um, so uh, what are some big things they're doing in .NET 7? Do you know, Misha, like, uh, I know like their C-sharp, uh, you know, 12 is cooking. 
Uh, and I think they have uh, additional uh, focus on, um, you know, containerizing your apps better and also, uh, you know, running things uh, cloud native. So, you know, big things cooking with .NET 7. Another thing, like we have, we have talked about this a few times, like .NET MAUI will ship, but um, some of the tooling for .NET MAUI is going to ship, you know, later on in the year, likely with, you know, .NET 7. So, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, they are uh, actually they with .NET 7. Uh, Microsoft has reworked, reworked the way interoperability works. So this is something we should handle as well. But so but we should know that there is a new thing around interoperability. Yeah. All right. Anything else uh, with just Mark? Uh, no, we are planning for the upcoming service pack, uh, what bugs uh, which will fix. So if you guys um, are experiencing any issues with just want to uh, let us know. You can write uh, in the chat or open a certificate. And, uh, yeah, just let us know what is bothering you so we can handle it. Absolutely. Cool stuff. Um, uh, hold on. Aaron is asking a question. Are, are the even versions still LTS? Oh. So what Aaron is asking is about, you know, .NET versions that are uh, marked LTS, which is long-term support. So .NET 6 was LTS. Now, I, I don't think it's it's a hard and fast rule because um, they made, they had made uh, .NET, uh, Misha, correct me, it wasn't .NET Core 3.1 LTS? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So it's it's yeah. not a, I think it's like every two to three years is what it is because it doesn't need to be all always even. So .NET six was LTS. I don't think seven is going to be. Uh, but again, I, I don't you know work for the .NET or Microsoft Teams, but uh, that's just my two cents. So I think every like two to three years is is the norm. Probably .NET eight will be. Yeah, .NET eight will be again. Yeah. All right, Michelle, good stuff. I'm going to take uh, your desktop down. But, uh, you know, thank you for all the work that you and the team put together uh, for Just Mock. I know it's uh, it's a lot of bleeding edge stuff, a lot of, you know, breaking changes at times, but you, you keep pushing. Mm -hmm. So good stuff, good stuff. And yeah, I see my good friend Eve in the back uh, room. See if I'm going to bring you on. Hello. Hey, it's almost lunchtime for you and me. Uh, so... Uh, Misho, uh, thank you so much for all things Just Mark. Um, uh, you are you are more than welcome to hang out and, and and heckle Eve here. But if you have to go run, it's late Friday evening. We'll understand. Uh, Rick, me, and Eve are all on East Coast time. All right, Eve. Do I need really need to know about my network? Uh, let's see. I mean, the anticipation was real. It's like you're running the sixteen hundred meter relay, and you're like the fourth leg. That's how I feel on this stream. So now it's like go time. Um, right. But yes. Well, how I about mean, we, we've, yeah, we, we can flip it. Uh, you know, we're doing a, a webinar, which is a more you know, formal affair next week. Uh, we'll let you go first. <laughs> well, that's a different kind of pressure. Like, yeah. you know, maybe just right <laughs> in the middle. Well, I'll work on that. Yeah. Uh -oh. And uh, Aaron has to go. Aaron, uh, good, good to see you around in the chat room as well. But uh, folks uh, who are uh, in the chat room, maybe just a quick recap of what we're doing. This is a stream where we're going over all things productivity in our... Um, uh, hold on. If I can uh, highlight some things here. Uh, oh, this was the, about the sessions being recorded. Um, we are uh, we are doing uh, you know a recap of all the productivity things for developers in our R2 release, which went out just... Uh, earlier this uh, week, uh, I think on Wednesday, right? 11th uh, was the release. So, Eve, Fiddler, uh, so Fiddler. chat room, this is what you've been waiting on. Uh, Eve to tell us all things Fiddler. We are ready. Eve, okay. ready to drink from, drink from the fire hose whenever you share your screen. Go time. I, Let me know when you see it. I do see it. Okay. So, to answer your question, do you need to debug your network traffic? Of course. <laughs> um, you know, that's a simple, but it is something to people maybe teeter with, or they aren't as quick to add that to the top of their list, but the consequences are too high not to do it, yeah. right? And by debugging, there's also other features that you can use within Fiddler everywhere in terms of mocking different scenarios. And, you know, there's preventative things that you can do. So it is very important. And just a quick highlight, you know, Fiddler has evolved into a family of products. I hey, know we've Eve, talked about uh, before you do that, can you hit that little hide button? Because my OCD is going to keep bothering oh, me. No problem. Thank you. 
<laughs> no problem. Um, and we've talked about how Fiddler is a family of products, right? We have our Fiddler Classic, um, Fiddler Everywhere. We have Fiddler Jam, which falls into uh, a troubleshooting solution. We have Fiddler Cap and then Fiddler Core, which is, you know, the, the embedded engine. Uh, but for the purpose of today's Twitch, we're going to be talking about Fiddler Everywhere, which is our cross-platform um, web debugging solution. And then we're going to briefly touch on Fiddler Jam, which we have introduced in some earlier sessions, which is um, that web-based troubleshooting solution. So that's more for support teams, but they do uh, work together. They are complementary. Um, so Fiddler Everywhere 3.2 doesn't disappoint um, as well in this release. And I'll just kind of give you a few of the things and I'll show you some demos. But a new big one is a session comparison, right? So let's say you have a session that, um, you have two sessions within the same tab, you can compare them um, side by side. You can look at the request data, the response data. And this happens when you know one is working, one is not, and you can't figure out that difference. You can put them in this nice view and look at them really quickly and quickly determine where that is. Another big one is certificate data, right? We're gonna show you information about that certificate chain, uh, whether it's expired or it's coming due, there's a lot that's gonna be in there. Um, and I'll, I'll go over that as well. Yeah, like how, how many times do we visit sites where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chrome or something is complaining about cert and you don't know, or maybe if it's, it's their own site and you don't know. And um, before you go into any more features, can we answer this quick thing here um, from the chat room here? I know sure. if you, you would love to answer this. So is there a way uh, to use Fiddler to intercept traffic from an application where you don't own the app, you cannot modify, and uh, maybe it's on a device? And, and the answer is yes, yes. yes. So uh, absolutely. Eve, yeah. Uh, t tell us, like, why why this is, you know, so helpful. Um, Oops, I, on, sorry. The yeah. Um, so, so Fiddler, you know, everywhere acts as that man in the middle, right? So it's in, it's in, it's as that proxy. So it's able to intercept that traffic, um, you know, between um, the server and as well as the device. So that's where that functionality comes into. Yeah, and there is no escaping a network proxy. Everything is going through it. And uh, this is why it is so good, certainly, Dev, to, you know, uh, look into any app that you are not, you know, responsible for, but see the traffic go back and forth and, mm -hmm. you know, understand uh, what's what's going on. It's it's actually a little, you know, uh, embarrassing when you turn on Fiddler for the first time and you see all the network calls going across. Uh, like you, Like your computer is making a lot of calls that you may not even be aware, like, Visual Studio calls home all the time, like Apple services, Microsoft and Google services, they're all calling home and doing stuff. So yes, and, and particularly uh, if you are running things on a device like uh, a mobile device, uh, we actually have docs that says, um, you know, here's how you can see your iOS traffic on Fiddler. And it, it's very telling, it's very nice for you to debug. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you open up, you can see here, I have this live traffic tab, you know, I've essentially or intentionally, um, modified this list, but it can be thousands, right? It is not uncommon for like a single web page to, um, you know, have 30 sessions right off the bat and that's just at minimum. So you will go through some different parts of a site and this list can get long, but to make it manageable and bite sized for th this presentation, I wanted to show you my example.com. So one of the big things in the Fiddler Everywhere um, 3.2 is to be able to match rules a specific number of times. And this is really nice. Before, when we've added rules, they're mainly used for like a single use execution and then you would disable them. Well, now what you can do is you go to the add rule in the rule builder. I take from my drop down and I say specific number of times. And for this one, let's say three. And then I have that example.com URL and you see a nice auto completion. And then I go over and I say, hey, I want to show these in yellow. And I hit save. Um, I go back into the composer and I use that example.com URL again and I hit execute. And this is pretty awesome. You go back to my live traffic tab and you can see that's highlighted for me. And then mm. also up here, it shows you how many times that rule has been executed out of what you set. I mean, and there's an infinite number of what you can do. Um, but this is really handy, like when you're testing applications, like in an unstable network, or you need to simulate a, a server drop on a public network. You can run these rules a certain amount of times and you're ready to go. Yeah, no, I can I can think of so many ways this like, you know, making it run a specific number of times is, is helpful because like a lot of times, like I have rules that I, I would have forgotten and they just keep on running. 
And now you can specify like while I'm debugging, only do this a uh, yes. few number of times. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then the other big one is this is I talked about that comparis comparison of sessions. But I just want to show you what that looks like. So I take two sessions and I right click, I hit compare, and I'm doing this all right inside Fiddler Everywhere. Um, I have the two columns. You can see a new tab opens up. Um, and I can look in the requests, I can look at the headers, the params, um, and then even down into the response. And I can find out where are those similarities, where are there differences. So this will help me figure out why is one working, one is not, and um, really highlight that without having to go externally or do any other things. It's all within the UI. Um, now the team has shared that we're planning to expand this feature in upcoming releases. So what you can do is do multiple sessions, right, beyond just the two, and then you can also with, do it with the live traffic and save sessions. Mm. So that would be nice. You can see in my left-hand column here, I have save sessions um, in a folder. So you'll be able to make those comparisons as well. So stay tuned for that. That's one of those to be coming, but exciting. Now this is uh, this this is uh, really interesting. So. Uh, when, when we are comparing two sessions, essentially you are comparing everything in that session, so requests and responses, and you're trying to see why one worked and why it didn't. Like, do we have any um, uh, any limitations on like does it need to be uh, two requests off to the same domain, or you can literally pick any two requests from your you know from your list of captured events? As long as they're right now in that same tab, you can okay. compare them. Um, okay. Then you, there will be you know, less limitations as we evolve this feature, but um, this just came out. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is what we had briefly talked about when I was going over the What's New blog. This is just how that certificate looks. You're right in the inspectors tab. It gives you that. Now this is what's really cool is you click on that and then it highlights. It gives you all the information on that certificate chain, like I mentioned. Um, and this was an example of like the certificate is valid, but also we know from different places, um, that's not always what we're going to get. So here's a certificate error. Again, you get the indicator. You can highlight over it or hover over it. Um, this one talks about you know how the certificate expired, um, about the validity period. You can go in further, get some more. Again, this is oh. all right here at your fingertips, right? You don't have to search things or go to different sites and try to piece this all together. This can be used for public shaming. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think about it that way, but sure. Um, and it's also right now hard coded to give you a warning that your certificate is going to expire in 30 days. So maybe this is something that you own, right? Like you're um, mm -hmm. you're responsible for their certificate. You get that indicator that hey, you have 30 days to make those changes. Otherwise, the certificate um, you're going to you know be in a situation where um, maybe your site's not accessible or there's other issues. Now, I do believe in the future you may be able to set that duration you know specifically to what you want but right now it is at the 30 days okay um and this is a real i think it was peter who mentioned like we're very user centric in terms of our improvements and enhancements and one of the big uh, convenient time saving features was to be able to get that total sizing sizes and timings available to you so you can do this right inside the overview tab you can see right at the top um, there and then if you go into the details you also get that as well so let's say you're wondering um, about the start of the first request the end of the first session it's all right here i mean there's there's nothing you have to do you don't have to do digging it's um, and that was a feature request from our users that we we're able to implement this go around wait could you scroll down like what, what was it that you showed like the start and the end of that request yes so you get the timings so you can see like the request was uh, 46 seconds um, the size was uh, 1.6 kilobytes, so you can just have that, you know, you can get it visually here, or you can, you know, go down into um, the, the actual details to get that information. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this one is another user feedback. Wanted to be able to see or display that few, full URL. So when you're working with the live traffic, um, we added this eye icon and you just hover over it and it gives you that full URL and you can copy it. So if you need to use that somewhere or um, investigate it further, it just gives you a shortcut so you're not searching around or just seeing an excerpt of it. 
So you just hover over and find that little eye icon and you're ready to go. And this is into Fiddler Jam and just the, the high level overview. Fiddler Jam is our bug reporting solution, which is in two parts. It is a Chrome extension that you would send to your users if you're a support team member. And then you have a portal, which is your workspace where you can see um, or preview the logs, figure out what are some of the issues, um, and then if needed, send it off to your development team. Um, but you're acting as that first issue resolution. Um, and what we did now, a couple of the big enhancements, was giving the end users a preview, right? So it's a Chrome extension. You hit Start Capture. You're reproducing the issue. Maybe you got an error. And now you have a preview button. So that's brand new. And with this preview button, you can go in and you can look at your capture. It's kind of like just double checking before you send something off to someone that you got exactly what you wanted. Um, and if you're happy with what you see, you click on that extension again. You hit the Get Link. It uploads, you copy that link, and then you send it off. So this just gives you the opportunity before you're sending someone all of your issues just to make sure you captured exactly what you wanted. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So it's like one one stop before you you know hit send. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the other big one is the ability to um, delete logs. So before you know, if you're a power user. A Fiddler Jam, you might have created quite a few log captures. Now, if you go under My Captures, you can see all of those. Now, I've only done two, but it wouldn't be um, crazy for someone to have hundreds. And uh, previously, you weren't able to delete them; they kind of just uh, were oh, archived. Oh so no, this is in this is in in your Jam session because yes. like in, in yep. Fiddler everywhere, I can delete. Yes. Yes. As a master user. Okay. Okay. Yep. But this is in Jam, so all those recordings you've done. Let's say you no longer need them, and your workspace is. Um, getting to be too messy, you can delete those and they're permanently deleted. So it just allows you to stay organized. Mm -hmm. um, and then Filter Jam, this is just a quick uh, overview of, you know, some of the extension, the portal, but there are some other things that um, I was given the go ahead to give a little bit of sneak peek. One, we're talking about um, JIRA integration. So those ticketing systems, you're going to be able to work with Fiddler Jam and those. A big one would be Fiddler Jam Embedded. So you could integrate um, Fiddler Jam's functionality into your web application through a code snippet. I think that's really big. Um, mm -hmm. And then also we're talking about um, some data masking within the videos as well as some enhancements to the predefined recording link. Um, and those are all things. I mean, what's really exciting is that the roadmap here is pretty robust. Um, and there's lots coming out, like we've talked about earlier, you know, Fiddler Jam, Fiddler Everywhere, and the Fiddler Family of Products. We have a dedicated um, engineering team, a support team, you know, product managers, everyone whose sole focus is on this. So you're really going to see a lot of things coming out, um, and everything continues to get better. Yeah. I, I particularly like the, you know, the emphasis that the team is putting on, you know, working together in a team because it's it's a, it's a team sport, right? right. So, uh, you know, you, you showed off the comparing of sessions like um, you and me are hitting the same API, mine's working, yours not. So now we get to, you know, load up your session and just compare. So, yeah. Very yeah. good stuff, very good stuff. So, I mean, I could go on all day. I've told Sam before, I'm better yeah. at talking about Fiddler than I myself. So if you want to talk Fiddler, I got you. I'm, I'm, I'm here. And if you're interested in any of the things that are coming that I mentioned about in Fiddler Jam, please reach out to our team through the forums. Um, there might be some early access bits that you can get your hands on. But otherwise, everything's ready to go. If you haven't checked out Fiddler Everywhere in a while, please download a trial. If you have Fiddler Everywhere, log in. You'll get the updated bits as, as soon as you get into um, the application. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so, chat room, we're here. Um, any any questions so far? Any anything uh, that relates to reporting or testing or uh, mocking or fiddler? We're here, and we'll also be here next uh, Thursday, right? Is is Thursday mm -hmm. in the webinar? Yeah. So, we'll be on next Thursday as well. Um, and uh, everything that we did here, including Rick's blue screens, are recorded for eternity. No, it wasn't a blue screen. It was just Rick disappearing for a little bit, but it's all good. We we love your book bookshelf and your your board games. I don't know why you why you had a, a you know virtual background. 
<laughs> I don't know. I thought it would be uh, you know, more more professional. I guess I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want to see my office because it is really messy. Your office is beautiful. <laughs> well, at least the four by four area directly behind me is. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I think we are uh, we we're really happy with the release. It's you know summertime, so you know people uh, want to be get done with their projects and you know ship them, things out and head out for vacation. So hopefully, we are trying to do things that make you all a little bit more productive. So you know, thank you, Rick, and uh, all things reporting. Thank you, Eve, and uh, I know the Fiddler team has been really cranking out a lot of things. Like you're on like. You know, superchargers trying to deliver all the things. So right. kudos to you all. All right, and uh, Aaron and Surly Dev and uh, Smelly Orc and everybody else in the chat room, thanks for hanging out. Harlem Hale, uh, Albrox, thanks for hanging out with us and you know asking us questions. Uh, this was good. Uh, you know, good recap and informal recap among friends who you know care about the products that we support. Um, so this was uh, kind of good. And to, uh, next week we get to do this uh, a little bit more formally uh, in a web webinar. Uh, oh, and uh, you, you got uh, Harlem Hale. He is a gamer too, right? There you go. Yeah. I, I'm a little Excellent. bit, uh, yeah, you know, I, I used to be a board gamer, but then like life happened and <laughs> I, I still tinker a little bit. Actually, we got our kid um, uh, the, the Ticket to Ride uh, game, uh, which is, you know, fairly popular. Mm -hmm. But for a six-year-old, it's it's just a little too much of patience that, that's needed. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get get more into back into board gaming as, as kiddo grows up. Well, we enjoyed that nice game of um, Carcassonne at that uh, yeah, convention. Yeah, Sam. yeah, yeah, exactly. Sam kicked my butt. I mean, he, no, he's He's a well, ringer. I mean, he says he's he, not a gamer. He, no, yeah. no. So Rick actually just taught me too well. He was trying to explain a game for the first time, and he just taught me too well. And there's a lot of luck involved sometimes. But it was okay. fun. I want to experience it sometime. I feel like I'm missing don't, out. Don't don't play poker with Sam. Uh -huh, got it. <laughs> Noted. Well. Um, uh, oh yeah, Harley has, has both good games. Yeah, so um, I know um, uh, Eve, you are actually going to one uh, place. So uh, Rick and me are big fans of uh, events that happen in uh, at the Kalahari, uh, and there are plenty of events now. So there is uh, Code Match that happens at the Ohio Kalahari. There is a Tech Bash that happens at uh, uh, the Pocono Mountains. There's a new one spun up uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, uh, is it Round Rock, uh, Texas? Right, that conference. That's coming up, uh, and aren't you going, Eve? I'm going to, to the Poconos. Okay, so and there then you I'm go. going so. up to the one in Wisconsin Dells. Okay, so there you go. Both of them are great for board gamers because they have like a dedicated evening where people bring their games out, and you sit around and you, you know, play all all night long. Well, I got to work uh, on my my which game I'm going to be skilled at then. Mm -hmm, like I can't just yeah. go in. Yeah. It sounds like it's going to get really competitive. <laughs> They're yeah, going to be very aggressive gamers. It uh, it, it uh, helps uh, having something to uh, you know uh, drink at hand that takes the edge away. Okay. Carcassonne tournament, yeah. And uh, Cindy's been uh, out with us. It's late evening for her as well. So thanks for hanging out with us, Cindy. And yeah, we should uh, we should do something uh, more board gaming live on on stream, so we can make fun of ourselves. Why not? Why not? Yeah, uh, and I think there is like a Friday, uh, doesn't uh, our uh, friend uh, Alyssa and I don't know if Ed's going to join. They do a Friday uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I think. Uh, maybe that's coming up this afternoon. I'm not quite sure. Yes, okay. And uh, nobody's so. invited me. I am offended <laughs> and hurt. <laughs> so I don't know if they do the same thing because uh, I, I haven't tuned in the last couple of evenings, uh, but every Friday evening uh, or afternoon they do that. Yeah. So it is today. It's coming up later on. All right. Uh, and uh, oh, well, lots of gamers in the chat room. Wingspan. Okay. I haven't played that. Have you, Rick? No, no, I haven't. Who, ma who makes it? Overland yeah. Gamer. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's actually not uh, too far away. That's coming up at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time for us. It's our Friday fantasy stream. But anyways, uh, this was fun. And so the Kendo UI folks did their thing yesterday. And uh, uh, oh, and uh, Cindy's uh, explaining what it is, the fantasy, fantasy sci-fi, the everything in between. OK, good, good, good. That's coming up this afternoon on Coded Live. 
So the coded uh, the, the Kinder UI folks did uh, a recap of their release yesterday. Today was all things productivity, and then Monday, um, Ed, me, and a few other engineers, we will unpack what's in the Telerik release, which is for all things web, mobile, and desktop. And then we will have you know two more formal webinars. So we are really trying to do justice to all the things our engineers and PMs have put together. And uh, it's a fun time to be. It's uh, uh, summer for most parts of the world. So. Oh, hey, uh, our good friend Lance is here. Oh, hello, hello. And I was lamenting to Lance about my many blue screens. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, and uh, you got an answer here from Overland Gamer, Stone Mirror. Oh, so, okay. They make good games. Hmm. Interesting. It's all about birds. Yeah. Oh, I think I'm going to go uh, a little watch it, watch it, watch it played, which is a yeah. great little video to see you know, new games. Yeah. All right, folks. I think uh, it's uh, it's lunchtime for us on the East Coast. We'll go uh, eat some lunch. Code Monkey Island is a fun board game to teach me the logic design. Okay, okay, that's good to know, Orlin Gamer. I might get into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, good stuff here. Good stuff. Uh, so, folks, thanks for hanging out with us uh, so much. And, uh, you know, this was an informal unpacking of the productivity suites, all things reporting, testing, just mock, and Fiddler. And, uh, you know, come back here uh, later this afternoon on Credit Live. We'll do a sci fi fantasy and DD stream. And then we'll see you Monday morning and uh, we'll unpack more of Telerik stuff. So, thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh, Harlem Hill said thank you all. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. And uh, even Rick, thank you personally for taking the time out to come and do this with me. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Yeah. All happy, right, folks. Happy Friday the 13th. Yes. Yeah. All right, folks. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.